All right, we are now in lecture 21, which is looking at chapter 19. A lot happens in chapter 19. We got uh, the final conclusion of Babylon the Great being destroyed, the marriage of the Lamb, and the invitation to the marriage supper, and the killing of the Antichrist and his army. So without further delay, let's get into it. Revelation 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with their immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah! And from the throne, uh, maybe this is from Jesus himself, came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Okay, so we start out with um, hallelujah, all right? And uh, in fact, we have four hallelujahs uh, between this and the, and the following verse. Uh, hallelujah, by the way, this is a transliteration. This is not a, 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 a translation. So it's a transliteration of the Greek word, alleluia, and that is used four times in the Bible, all here in Revelation 19. And this Greek word is itself a transliteration, not a translation, of the Hebrew words halal and yah, translated as praise the Lord or praise Yahweh. So obviously, uh, this is the only four times of hallelujah in the New Testament. This is a moment of monumental joy. Why? For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Now, I think we can relate in all the injustices that we're living in today in the world and knowing that it's going to even get worse and worse. What a joy it is every time that we see justice served. So you can imagine the joy of the magnitude of this justice being served. However, it's not over yet. We're still just beginning now in chapter 19, and there's going to be much more evil to be destroyed and judge. Only the great prostitute has been judged so far, Babylon the Great. The next to be uh, judged uh, is going to, and, and destroyed is going to be the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, and their armies. Uh, they will be conquered, destroyed, and judged next. However, for now, we have the great prostitute and smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now, what this is saying is that this judgment is final. There are, uh, you know, unlike uh, the world we live in, there are no appeals. Uh, and the punishment is also eternal forever and ever. So let's read on verse 6. And then, because it only gets better, then I hear what seemed to be a voice of great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. So once again, Hallelujah! This is a moment of tremendous, exceptional joy. Why? For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. God's reign on earth is now beginning, finally. And uh, possibly this is, is still a, a continuation of what we read back in Revelation 11. If you recall in verse 15, when the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. So God's reign on earth is now beginning and he shall reign forever 
and ever. Just like the hallelujah chorus of uh, Handel's Messiah. Uh, there's a reason why everybody stands up with joy. Because he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for the rewarding of your saints, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So very likely this is just a continuation or even just in the middle of what is recorded in Revelation chapter 11. Let's read on because it gets better. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now here it's worthwhile to uh, uh, tear apart some of these words. Let us rejoice. Uh, charo, which just means that. To rejoice, to be glad, to be joyful, to be full of joy. But that is not enough. Let us rejoice and exult. Exult is taking rejoicing up to a much higher level. Agalio. It means to jump for joy, to jump for joy, to be exceedingly glad with exceeding joy and to rejoice greatly and give him the glory, the glory, doxa, dignity, honor, praise, worship. Uh, this is just uh, Psalms 118, verse 22, being played out. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. This is Yahweh's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that Yahweh has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So this is a very special and an important occasion. This is a pinnacle moment in the entire history of mankind. That is how important this occasion is. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. This is massive. This is monumental. This is what we as mankind have been looking for since the beginning of time. And this is the culmination of so many scriptures leading up to this moment. Starting all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when God said, let us make mankind in our image. Why is that? In our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And later on in chapter 2, the Lord Yahweh said, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then Yahweh, God, made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So why was God doing all this? Why is this all being recorded in Scripture? Well, God wants a relationship. He wants a family. He wants an intimate relationship with someone that he can relate to, that can only be explained in terms of a marriage. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Scriptures went on to say in Exodus, therefore remember uh, God saying, say to the Israelites, I, Yahweh, will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you. That word was leka, to take a woman to marry as a wife. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And then later on at Mount Sinai, he says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. 
although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is massive. More scriptures leading up to this. Hosea talking about the adulterous wayward wife which portrayed what Israel was back then. And in that day declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my bile or master. Later, long in three verses later, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love, and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know Yahweh. This is why everybody is in such a joyous celebration. But scripture goes on. The prophet Jeremiah was instructed to, to uh, where God says, I have loved you. With an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you, although you have not been faithful to me. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. In other words, what he's saying is you shall be born again. And we will marry. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, 54, verse 5. For your maker is your husband. Yahweh of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For Yahweh has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. And for in a brief moment I deserted you, with, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting joy I will have compassion on you, says Yahweh your Redeemer. Let's go to the New Testament because it's a culmination of New Testament scripture as well. This is where John the Baptist answered, I am not the Christ. I'm not the anointed one. I'm not Messiah. But I have been sent before him, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. What a monumental statement the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Well, if you think it was complete then, what about now? Here's from the Apostle Paul. I wish I could, I wish you could bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betroth you to one husband and to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Wow. Hallelujah. So the question uh, that we obviously would ask is, okay, who is the bride? Is she just Jew? Is she Jewish? Is she, you know, the 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 bloodline of Israel, or is she Gentile, or is she both? Well, let's look at some scripture. Romans 11, such a pivotal chapter where, where it talks about God rejected his people. Now, that was the Jews. Has God rejected his people? No, by no means. What? But what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened, as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor down to this very day. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Whoa! If their failure means riches for the Gentiles, however, how much more will their inclusion, the Jewish inclusion, mean? 
Some of the branches were broken off, yes. And you, Gentiles, although you were a wild olive shoot, you were grafted in among the others. And even they, the Jews, Jewish people, if they do not continue in their unbelief, in other words, if they start believing in Yeshua as the Messiah, they will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. This is the new covenant that was explained in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. For if you, the Gentiles, were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, we were cut from a different tree, but we are grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated tree, olive tree, how much more will these Jews, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial, which means not complete, hardening has come upon Israel. Why? until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers way back in the days of Genesis and Exodus. So let's read on. So who's the who's the bride? Well, what we just read in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 11 and Olive branches terms, all the natural olive branches that are the Jews that are joined or grafted back into the tree, as well as the wild olive branches, the Gentiles of the church that have been grafted into the tree with one requirement though, and this is very, very important. Everyone has accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah, and have put their trust in his atonement, in his sacrifice, in his crucifixion to die for our sins. And then it's explained by Paul in, in Galatians 3.29, and if you are Christ, if you're Messiahs, then guess what? You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That is something to exalt in, to jump up and down about. Romans 4.11, he, that being Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him, Abraham, the father of all who believe without being circumcised. Circumcision was no longer a requirement so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So who is the bride? It's the church. But the church is both Jew and Gentile that accept Yeshua as Messiah. It's explained further in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, as Christ gave himself up for her, as that he, Jesus Christ, might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with what? The word, which is his word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, but that's what are we talking about? This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is the marriage of the lamb that has come and the bride has made herself ready. Hallelujah. It was granted to her uh, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, 
for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So it says here in verse 8, the bride has made herself ready. Actually, verse 7, indicating responsibility and action on her part. She has made herself ready, which among other things would be the righteous deeds of the saints. Why do we say that? Well, that revelation is full of examples of how saints have overcome by their righteous deeds. Uh, the fifth seal in Revelation 6-9, when, when Jesus opened the fifth seal and saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Uh, later in chapter 11, verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast, the Antichrist that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Horrible. But chapter 12, verse 11, they, they have conquered him, the Antichrist, the false prophet. They have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb. So it's not all, it's not all their part, but there is a role that they play. And by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. Wow. Later on, verse 17, the dragon became furious with the woman who was Israel, the Jewish people, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is fine linen, the righteous deeds of the saints. Okay, so when we look at fine linen, bright and pure, I think we also need to compare uh, to, uh, to the white garments that are found in Revelation. And here's the reason why. We'll use two examples of two of the seven letters written to the church, which is actually the church, the universal church. Revelation 3, verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed. The one who conquers... And we know how they conquered by the word of their testimony and lived not, loved their life not unto death. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of light. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To another church he wrote, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments garments so that you may be so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve uh, to anoint your eyes so that you may see in revelation 6 verse 11 the opening of the fifth seal then they the martyred saints were each given what a white robe and they were told what to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be the bride of Christ, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Revelation 7, verse 13. Now, this is when uh, when the multitudes before the throne, uh, singing, hallow, uh, uh, singing before God in praise and worship uh, with uh, palm branches. And uh, one of the elders addressed John, saying, John, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they been? And I, John, said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. She has been granted to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, because this fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. As prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall exult in my God. So once again, this is, this is uh, rejoicing on steroids. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And then listen. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, 
For as the earth brings forth, it sprouts, and as a garden causes what is to be sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Let us rejoice and exult. Now, this is a, a, a quote from one of the commentaries I, I really like. Um, this is called Revelation, a shorter commentary. Well, shorter is 555 pages. Uh, his full version is over 1,300 pages uh, by G.K. Beale. And this is what he wrote about the fine linen. He says, this dual sense of fine linen here suits admirably the rhetorical purpose of the entire book of Revelation, which includes exhortations to believers to stop soiling their garments, as it was in one of the letters to the churches back in Revelation chapter 3, and not to be found naked, which was another letter to the church in chapter 3, and also in 1615. This underscores the aspect of human accountability, human accountability, highlighted by verse 7 here. His bride has made herself ready. Yet the readers can be encouraged to obey the exhortation with the knowledge that God, it's God that has provided the grace for them to clothe themselves now by the power of the Spirit. God has granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Now let's read on verse 9. <clears throat> and the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we have to ask the question, is the wedding ceremony, is it happening now in heaven or is it going to occur later on earth? Well, the way this is written in, Roman, in Revelation chapter 19, uh, the marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Uh, will indicate that it's happening now, happening in heaven. But what about those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, this passage here this this verse is only telling us that the invitations are going out and that blessed are those who come who accept as for when and where the marriage is the marriage supper well one of the things we may want to consider is what jesus said at his last passover dinner with his disciples where he said i have earnestly desired to eat this passover with you before i suffer for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So what he's saying then is that we're going to continue this dinner. We're going to continue this supper. But it will not continue until it is it, the Passover, the Passover uh, lamb, the Passover king, uh, the whole Passover experience until it is fulfilled where? In the kingdom of God. And we know heaven is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is going to be the new heaven and the new earth. That is God's kingdom. So let's read on because there's additional scripture supporting the marriage supper being on earth. Uh, first, let's go back to Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 25, verse 6, on this mountain. Okay, what mountain is that? Most likely Mount Zion. The Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. I mean, what's a feast without well-aged wine of, of rich food? food full of marrow of aged wine well refined and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations he will swallow up death forever and the lord god 
will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. This is heavy. This is monumental. Uh, in the New Testament Gospels, in Luke 14, 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. He knew his Old Testament. He knew uh, what Jesus had said. I came not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 8, I tell you, many will come from the east, from the west, and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And that's just the beginning of the list. And the people, and in Luke 13, and people will come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Wow. Hallelujah. So, the, the marriage supper, if we're going to try to hypothesize when it's going to happen, it's most likely to happen after everything is finished, meaning it's going to be a celebration of victory of the believers over Antichrist. It's going to be a celebration of Israel's redemption and reconciliation to God, of Jesus' completed work, conquering evil and ushering in the millennium, Jesus' rule and reign as king of all the earth. And oh, by the way, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Verse 10. This is an interesting one. Then I, John, fell down at his feet to worship him. Who's him? That's an angel. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I fell down at his feet to worship him. This happens twice in Revelation. John And John records it uh, in all humility. Him himself worshiping an angel, which is also in Revelation 22, 8, rather than God. This is idolatry, pure and simple. However, in both cases, the angel was quick to rebuke John. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this recorded in Scripture? Well, maybe it's to make a point of just how gullible mankind can be. Maybe this is why Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 that false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Wow. Even the elect. And then it goes on, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Not the easiest verse to interpret. But maybe this is the angel's reason for not worshiping him. The angel is saying, hey, I'm a messenger. The truth is found in Jesus. That is the spirit of prophecy. And then also, one thing we need to keep in mind is prepositions. And in this case, uh, there's preposition of of used a couple of times, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. That's not in the original Greek. So in the original language would be testimony, Jesus, the spirit, prophecy. Okay, so we're going to stop part one of this video here, and we will continue um, picking up where we left off in chapter 19 the killing of the Antichrist and his armies, one of the most famous scenes recorded in Revelation.